Hello, my name is Chris Albertson, and I'd like to welcome you to my Switchport link aggregation video where we'll go over Ether Channel and how to set up Ether Channel. So, the objectives of this video, as I said, are to go over Ether Channel and its setup. And areas we're going to cover is why you would want to aggregate with the Ether Channel, um, the requirements to aggregate links together to form an Ether Channel. Uh, load balancing and the different types of options you might have with layer 2 and layer 3 devices. Ether channel negotiation protocols such as port aggregation protocol, the Cisco proprietary protocol, or link aggregation control protocol, which is an IEEE standard. And then we'll go over the configuration of Ether channel using port aggregation protocol and link aggregation control protocol. So why would we want to aggregate with the Ether Channel? Well, Ether Channel affords us the ability to use multiple links on our existing hardware to virtually achieve the throughput of the next higher grade of hardware. And what I mean by that is, let's say, for instance, we're talking about a fast Ethernet switch. Now, a fast Ethernet switch will give us, out of a single port, 200 megabits of full duplex communication. And a gigabit Ethernet switch out of a single port will give us two gigabits of full duplex communication. And a 10 gigabit Ethernet switch would give us 20 gigabits of full duplex communication. Now, if we have a fast Ethernet switch and we want to simulate as closely as possible the throughput of a gigabit switch, we could take eight channels or take eight ports off of our fast Ethernet switch and combine them together to form a fast ether channel. Now this fast ether channel in theory would give us 1,600 megabits of full duplex communication. And as we remember, one gigabit port would give us, in, it would give us two gigabits of full duplex communication or our fast ethernet our fast ether channel is giving us 1.6 gigabits of full duplex, which is almost two gigabits. So our eight channels off of our fast ethernet switch combined into a fast ether channel would give us virtually the throughput of a single gigabit switch ethernet port. And if we take that one step higher, we could take six or eight gigabit ports on a gigabit switch and form a gigabit ether channel, which would give us 16 gigabits of full duplex communication. And as we already discussed, a 10 gigabit single port on a 10 gigabit switch gives us 20 gigabits of full duplex communication. So 16 gigabits is virtually 20. If we wanted higher than 16, of course, we would upgrade to a 10 gigabit ethernet switch and combining those eight links on a 10 gigabit ethernet switch to form a 10 gigabit ether channel would give us 160 gigabits of full duplex communication. So as we can see here, by using ether channel, we can incrementally increase the throughput of our network without actually having to buy new hardware. Also, ether channel will offer us some redundancy and fault tolerance, because as we combine links together, if any of those links fail, usually that's not really too much of an issue because the other links will continue to carry the load. And as those links come back up, they'll begin to carry the load. And on some protocols like link aggregation control protocol, you can use standby links that can take over for, for failed links. And we'll go over that here in a little bit. In order for us to bundle ports together to form ether channel, our ports have to meet some basic requirements. If we're going to bundle access ports together, all of the access ports have to be a member of the same VLAN. Now, if we're going to bundle trunks together, these trunks have to be all passing the same VLANs and configured with the same native VLAN. Also, the physical um, layer one uh, settings for the ports must be the same. They must have the same speed and duplex settings. And we must have identical spanning tree settings on all the ports that are going to make up our Ether channel. At some point, load balancing on our Ether channel is going to be a concern. A layer 2 switch typically will use the source MAC address as a default form of load balancing. 
Now you can imagine by using the source MAC address, I'll use an example here. Let's say I have my PC connected to a switch and then that switch is connected with the ether channel to another switch which is then connected to my gateway. My switch MAC address will always remain the same and all the traffic that might go out of a two bundled ether channel with my source MAC address to the gateway would always favor one channel and the reason for this is because once a channel is chosen or a link is chosen within an ether channel to move traffic from one source to a destination that link is always used so any traffic from my PC going anywhere within my network would always use the same link no matter how many links were in my ether channel now a layer 2 switch will also offer me the ability to use a destination MAC address as a form or criteria for load balancing. Now when I start to do this, as we know, all the different sources or all the different destinations I mean on my network would have individual unique MAC addresses. So in theory, my PC, which has one sole MAC address, instead would use various different destination MAC addresses to travel down the ether channel. So as you can see, uh, using the destination MAC address for my um, load balancing option within my ether channel might be a better choice. But then again, you know, if you all your traffic is going to go out through the gateway, which you have numerous PCs and everybody's surfing the internet, that gateway MAC address is going to be used so everybody's traffic would be on one link. So you basically have to examine your your traffic load and how it's how it's distributed across your network and then determine what type of load balancing you're going to use. Now a layer 3 switch will typically give you a hash of the source and destination IP address as a default form of load balancing. But if you're not using the IP frames on your network say you're using Apple Talk or some other t type of networking on your on your hardware um, we can use the MAC address for load balancing and whenever we take two different criteria and we want to use those together to load balance we're going to hash those together with the NEXOR and we're going to use the least significant bits of the hash now in, in our first example where I talked about using the source MAC address as a form of our criteria for load balancing we would still use the least significant bits of that hash or of that source MAC address unhashed and as we go up in the higher higher grade equipment um, we will be afforded the ability to, you know, low balance with MAC address, a source or destination, or maybe a hash of the two, a source IP address, a destination IP address, or a hash of the two. And in some cases, the port number, you know, the, the destination or source port numbers, or a hash of the two. Now, one key thing to remember, that when we identify bundles within our Ether channel, we're going to use um, basically digits within the least 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 significant portion of our data either our basic criteria like a source MAC address or our hashed XOR result now for a two bundle ether channel we require one bit the most least significant bit that we're going to use for our low balancing criteria to determine what link we're going to use so link one would be the value of zero and link two would be the value of one. Now, if we have four bundles within our ether channel, we need to use the two least significant bits within our criteria. And zero, zero being to link one and one, one being to link four. And in the eight bundle ether channel, we require the, the, the three least significant bits within our criteria to determine the link that would be used on, on our eight bundle ether channel let's go ahead and work through a hash here what I have is a source and distant destination IP address which might be what you would expect for a layer 3 switch to be the default and we're going to take this and we're going to apply this as if we were using a four link ether channel and the two addresses we're going to use are these two right here 192.168.15.134 and then dot four 
Either or can be the source or destination. It really wouldn't matter in this case. Now, in order for us to use the least significant bits, I've gone ahead and you put the last octet here in this particular graph, and I've changed each of these least significant octets into a binary number. And then the least significant bits within that are the far right bits. So as we remember, our four link ether channel requires two bits to identify the links. And the least two significant bits of 134 are 1 and 0, whereas the least significant bits of 4 are 0 and 0. Now when we take these and XOR them together, the individual bits together, we get this result of 1, 0. And the way this works is an XOR, whenever it has two values that are, that are equal or the same, in this case 0 and 0, the result will be a 0. If there was a 1 and a 1 here, the result would be a 0. And then when we're comparing two in, unequal values, as a, like in this case a 1 and a 0, the result will be a 1, or a 0 and a 1, the result would be a 1. So basically, what we've done here, we've, we've XORed the least significant bits of the source and destination MAC address, and we've come up with a 1, 0. And 1, 0 is link 3 within our 4 link ether channel. So all traffic moving from this source to this destination, or this destination to this source, would hash the same way and always use link 3 within our 4 link ether channel to move traffic between those two devices. Now, as we had discussed before, as we begin to use various different MAC addresses and we XOR that those, or I'm sorry, different IP addresses, and we we XOR those various different IP addresses, we'll come up with different combinations of numbers statistically, which will allow us to more evenly load balance across our four link ether channel. When we use one criteria to load balance with, we don't have to perform any hash or XOR operation on our any two values. What we'll do is we'll use the least significant bits of whatever criteria we're using. Now let's say, for instance, on our source and destination options on our layer two switch, we can't combine those two, but we can use either the source MAC address or the destination MAC address to load balance with. And in this case, what I've have, we still have a we still have our four link ether channel and we have a MAC address here. B C A E C five three zero one A E five. And the least significant bit is going to be this last hexadecimal number here. Now what I've done if I went ahead and changed this into a binary number again and we go down here and the, again, the least significant bits are the last two bits within this hexadecimal number. And we're not going to do any type of hash. We're just going to use these two last bits to choose which channel within our four link ether channel to use. And in this case, this particular MAC address would result in the use of link two because that would be the le least two significant bits of five. 0 and 1. So if this was a destination MAC address, all the PCs that were trying to communicate to this particular NIC card would always use link 2. Or if this was a source MAC address, all data from this particular this particular MAC address would use link 2. Now statistically, you know, you're not going to have one PC using an ether channel. You're going to have numerous PCs on each side of the switch and maybe you know numerous different hardware around it, all going to have different MAC addresses. And basically as we go through our different combinations we would use different different links within our ether channel. But as I stated earlier in, the, in this little video, you have to examine the traffic loads of your network and determine what would be the best type of load balancing to use to get the best performance out of your ether channel. And I think it's become pretty clear by this point that load balancing is never going to be a, a rock solid guarantee of distributing traffic evenly across your ether channel. And that's because 
once a link is chosen to move traffic, that link is always going to be used. But statistically, as we had stated, we should have an even distribution of traffic across our, our Ether channel. And the best way to choose the best form of load balancing is to examine your load or traffic patterns and adjust the method of, of load balancing used to get the best performance out of your Ether channel. And when we set up our Ether channel, we're going to have the ability to choose between two separate negotiation protocols. The first one we want to go over is port aggregation protocol. Now this is a Cisco proprietary Ethernet Ether channel negotiation protocol. And what port aggregation protocol will allow us to do is if we make any changes to a single port or single link within our Ether channel, those changes will be dynamically propagated to our other links. So let's say for instance I have a fast Ethernet switch that's made up of four Ether channel bundles or four links and I was to take one of those links and I was to change the speed to 10 megabits. Port aggregation protocol would then dynamically configure all the other ports within the Ether channel to be at 10 megabits of speed. So as you can see, this could be a very useful tool, especially when you have a large Ether channel with, with eight channels. Now an Ether channel can also be configured with a passive and active mode. And for port aggregation protocol, the active mode is called desirable, similar to dynamic trunking protocol, where the desirable mode of operation will seek out um, the other end of the connection, be it the trunk in dynamic trunking protocol or um, the other endpoint in Ether channel. And if the other endpoint can support Ether channel, a link will be formed because desirable mode is an active mode. And Auto mode, which is the default mode of operation for port aggregation protocol, similar to dynamic trunking protocol, it is a, very, it's a passive mode of operation. So if you have two endpoints that are in auto mode, no Ether channel will be formed. Now we can also set port aggregation protocol to be mode on, which is basically telling it to set up an Ether channel no matter what. Now we also have a silent sub-mode, which is the default mode of operation for port aggregation protocol. And what this mode will allow us to do is port aggregation protocol will still try to ne negotiate a, a connection to the far endpoint, but if it does not receive any type of reply, it will still assume that the other end or the other endpoint on the Ether channel can support Ether channel. Now, we might want to use this for devices that don't necessarily support port aggregation protocol, but do have Ether channel capability. Let's say, for instance, we have a server or some other network device that can be connected to with port or uh, Ether channel. Uh, this would be a good option to, to set up that Ether channel. Now, if we expect the other end, the other endpoint, to reply with port aggregation protocol negotiation packets, we can turn that silent mode off. And what will happen here in this case is as port aggregation protocol attempts to negotiate, if it does not receive any type of replies or doesn't receive any negotiation packets, it will not set up the Ether channel. In fact, it will keep the, the ports up but it will inform STP that those ports are in a down state, even though they're up. Link aggregation control protocol is the second Ether channel negotiation protocol we want to cover. Now, this protocol is defined by the IEEE standard 802.3 AD, and being an IEEE standard is supported across multiple platforms and multiple manufacturers. It also offers an active and passive mode of operation with the mode active and the mode passive commands when building the Ether channel. We can also assign roles to each of the endpoints within the Ether channel. And a system priority is used to determine which endpoint will be the one that controls all decisions on the Ether channel. And that's made up of a 2-byte priority and a 6-byte MAC address. Now the system priority command can be used to influence which switch is going to be the controlling switch. And valid values that we can use 
with the system value, system priority command are 1 through 65,535. Now, if we don't use the system priority command, the, the default value of 32,768 would be used. Now, the switch with the lowest system priority value would be the switch that makes any decisions on the ether channel. Now, let's say, for instance, we have two switches that are set to the default. We don't use a system priority command to try to influence the decision on which switch is going to be the controlling switch. In that case, the MAC address would be used as the deciding criteria. So whichever switch had the lower MAC address would then become the controlling switch. Now we can also prioritize links within our Ether channel. And it's done with the priority port priority command. And port priority is made up of a two byte priority set with the port priority command and a two byte port number. And the port priority command can just as um, system priority uses the same values of 1 through 65,535, where 32,768 is the default priority setting. Now, links or ports with the lowest priority will be used first, and higher priority links will be used last. We can assign up to 16 links to an Ether channel with link aggregation control protocol, where the lowest four value, or I'm sorry, the lowest eight value Ether channels would be used to build our Ether channel, and the remaining links would be used as standby links. So when we set the priority of the links with the priority command, we can influence which links will be preferred in our Ether channel and which links will be standby links. Okay, let's go ahead and do some real quick down and dirty configurations of Ether channel with um, the two negotiation protocols, port aggregation protocol and link aggregation control protocol. And we've got two actual switches here, access one and access two. Access one is one that we're going to do all of our configurations on. Access two is already configured to be supporting both of these aggregation protocols on different ports. And I've already got two cables hooked up between our two switches and they are acting as trunk ports because dynamic trunking protocol has dynamically set up trunks between these two switches over these two links. Now, I'm not ashamed to say that at one point when I first started out in networking, I assumed that the more cables you hook between switches, the more data you can actually move between them. But at, as we um, know, that's not the case because spanning tree has actually been designed to ensure that doesn't happen because actually doing that kind of thing could cause broadcast storms, routing loops, uh, and, and such things as that in our network. And what has happened here is Spanning Tree has actually blocked Fast Ethernet 02 and it's actually forwarding data out of Fast Ethernet 01. Now we'll go over how this all worked in our next, next video, but just suffice it to say that our assumption that hooking two cables increased our throughput just by hooking more cables. In fact, that is not the case. Now, if we wanted to actually get the full potential of our two cables, our, our 100, gig, 100 meg interfaces, um, we would actually have to use an ether channel to do so. So we're going to go ahead and configure one, and we're going to use the port aggregation protocol to do so. We're going to use the interface range command because that's probably the most expedient way to uh, configure both of these interfaces at the same time. Oops. Two. So we're going to use fast Ethernet 0, 1 through 2. We're going to use a channel protocol of port aggregation control. All right, port aggregation protocol. And we're going to set up a channel group. We're going to call it channel group 1 and we're going to set the mode to desirable. Oops. Now if we go back and look at our trunk, 
we'll see that we're actually using a port channel now to trunk, which is a combination of our of our two cables, which we'll see with any show ether channel port channel. And we can see here that we are using past Ethernet one and two within our ether channel and we're using port aggregation protocol. And if we go back and look at spanning tree, we'll see that we're no longer blocking fast Ethernet 2, but we're actually forwarding out the virtual interface of port channel 1, which is the combination of those two um, fast Ethernets. Now, if we wanted to remove um, this particular port channel, I'm going to show run real quick. Oops. We can do a config t, and then we do another interface range command with fast Ethernet 0, 1 through 2. We do a no channel group desirable. And a no channel protocol PAGP. Actually, we need to do another, one more step because if we don't remove the actual interface port channel, it's going to still show up. Let me show you. Channel port channel. And here we see the port channel is still there even though we don't have any, any links within it because we took both of them out. Um, let's go back to config terminal. We're going to say no interface port channel 1. Now there is no more port channel. Now if we were to want to now go ahead and set up link aggregation control protocol, it's pretty much almost the same type of configuration. We're going to go config t interface range Fast Ethernet 0, 1 again through 2. And um, we'll do a channel protocol of link aggregation control protocol. And we'll do a channel group 2 mode. And if you remember, the keywords for active mode are actually active and passive mode are actually passive. So we're going to go active. Now if we had wanted to set the priority of this switch, we can do that here because it has to be done within the, the global um, configuration. And that would be done with the I think it's LACP. Let me try this. A system priority. And then, of course, we would set the values from 1 to 65,535. Let's go ahead and leave this as the default, though. And let's go ahead and go, ahead and go to interface FA01. And here we would be able to set a port priority. And we'd be able to use the same values, but we'll leave these as default also. And as you recall, that if we don't set a system priority, the MAC address of the switch, basically the lowest MAC address switch, would become the, the switch that made any decisions on port channels. And in the port priority, the interface, the lowest lowest interface, would actually be the control unit or be the first interfaces used. So we would actually use like interface fast ethernet 01 before we would use 24 if we didn't set the port priority. And again, if we, do, if we show the ether channel, port channel, we will see that we have our two interfaces in our port channel and we're using actually link aggregation control protocol here.
and our trunk is using port channel 2 which we configured there and spanning tree is not blocking any of the interfaces it's actually forwarding the logical um, interface port channel 2 or ether channel number 2 you might ask how I was I able to um, configure two different protocols on Fast Ethernet 01 and 02. Actually, between these two configurations, I had paused the video and moved the, the cables on switch access to, to the appropriate ports to allow for this configuration. Now, let's go ahead and remove this configuration. Let's do a show run. And basically, we're not going to remove this, but if we wanted to remove it, we would do the interface range of fast Ethernet 01, 02, and then do the no of these commands. And then we would do a no interface port channel 2. But we want to go ahead and keep this configuration to show the load balancing options that we have available to us. And what I've, I've, what I've done already is I've, I've started to move some data over this port channel. So if we do a show interface port channel 2, we're actually going to see some data and not a lot. Let's see right here. We've got 200 bits of data coming in per second. 2,000, I'm sorry. It's a pretty small amount of data by the looks of it. But as you can see, we are incrementing packets. On this port channel. Now if I was to show interface fast ethernet 01, I could see that this particular interface does not look like it's being used. But fast ethernet 02 is actually being used. So if you remember from our load balancing discussion, we, we said that whenever we decide, be it from a hash or from a least significant value of a, a criteria that we select, once we decide what channel we're going to use, that channel is pretty much always going to be used. And here we see that we are using pretty much fast ethernet 2 to, to uh, move data into our switch and fast ethernet 1 is pretty much not being used at all. Now what I will do is I will go ahead and um, start some some streaming here off the internet Let's see if we can't get a little more traffic on our Ether channel. And um, let me see here. Let's go to Sirius XM. And I'm cranking that up now. And what this will do is right now I'm, I'm streaming something from my server, and now I'll stream something from the internet. And we'll see if those two separate source MAC addresses will, will um, give us different channels in use. Okay, so now I'm streaming some music. And let's check this again. Fast Ethernet 01 is basically still not being used, but Fast Ethernet 02 is being used. It's still about the same throughput it looks like. So now the actual load balancing we're using right now, if I go to show ether channel load balance, we'll see we're using the source MAC address as our load balancing. Now let's go ahead and use the destination MAC address as our method of load balancing. We'll see how that changes our traffic. So we would go to config T and it would basically be port channel 
um, port channel, load balance, and options we have are to use the destination or source. So let's go ahead and use the destination MAC address. Now let's go ahead and check what we got going on for moving the traffic here. Still, looks like um, Fast Ethernet 01 is dead in the water. And, oops. Fast Ethernet 02. It's still pretty much moving all the traffic. So that didn't really make much of a difference. But anyway, as you can see, you can examine your, your flow of traffic by looking at individual interfaces within your within your port channel or you can view the load by show, doing the show ethernet again show ethernet port channel and these two values right here are the load values pretty much my load is so small right now for this switch that they remain at zero but if for some reason we felt that any particular links within our ether channel were overloaded we could view these values and see which one had the higher hex value which would equate to the load and that would mean it had the most load or we can go and view each of these these interfaces individually so I think that is it in a nutshell so the areas that we covered today were um, why we would want to aggregate with the Ether channel and how Ether channel offers us the ability to almost achieve the throughput of a next higher technology switch or a, like a eight, eight links within a fast Ether channel would give us 1600 megabits, which is almost two gigabits that we would get from a full duplex connection on a gigabit switch. And then we discussed the requirements that links had to have in order to be joined within a ether channel, what had to be common between the two, be it VLANs trunked or, or physical settings for interfaces. Then we went over the different types of load balancing we might see between layer two and layer three switches, be it source and MAC addresses or combinations of hashed source and destination IP addresses. Then we also discussed the two Ether channel negotiation protocols, the Cisco proprietary port aggregation protocol and the IEEE standard link aggregation control protocol. And then we did some configurations of those two um, negotiation protocols in setting up an ether channel and we went over some some load balancing and how to change that so that is that and I again am happy that you came here and saw my switch port link aggregation video and that's my IP address or my my, my uh, host address, my website address right here. So if you wish to uh, make any comments on this video, you can go here and do so, or you can do it on the, on the YouTube page where you found this. Again, thank you, and hope to see you on my Spanning Tree Protocol uh, video, which I'm going to be doing next. All right, bye-bye.